Dr. Gregor had some strong words in favor of cocoa powder during a presentation that he gave wherein he discussed a number of studies on the topic of muscle function in older people. And then he took it a step further by pointing out the benefits to mitochondrial function. I decided, since I haven't covered Dr. Gregor's content in quite some time, I'd crack open the studies that he cites and see if there's any truth to the claims. So, is he full of broccoli? I'll answer that last question. Yes. Yes, he is. But I mean that literally. Anyway, he mentions one study looking at people in their 60s and the effect of cocoa powder has on muscle function. Let's listen in on what he has to say first. Older men and women are randomized to a single tablespoon of regular cocoa powder a day experience a significant improvement in muscle strains, muscle mass, and all four measures of physical performance. And no, the study was not funded by Hershey's. Unfortunately, the tastiest cocoa did not work as well. The control groups here were just given the same amount of highly dutched cocoa, alkalized cocoa, where some of the bitter compounds removed during the dutching process are the very flavonoids uh, responsible for the benefits. If you're part of the physiotic community, you know full well how I feel about flashing study titles and even data without explaining what's happening on screen. I realize it's sometimes necessary, but it should be avoided when possible. Considering this is a short video, I understand why it's not possible here, but it is possible for us. So let's crack open that study. So we'll go over the study results, which are in some ways not represented quite as I'd want. If we look at the data, I realize this isn't the bar graphs that he showed, but that's because the table offers more information than what was mentioned in the video. Uh, we have three conditions shown up top. So placebo, NF, and flavonoids. The flavonoids condition is the only group that received the unaltered natural cocoa. Then we have three physical function tests, the up and go, which sounds like a country dance, uh, SMI, which stands for skeletal muscle index. Uh, it's a little like BMI, but only for muscle. And finally, hand grip strength. We see the baseline values, which represent the results before consuming the respective treatments of placebo, NF, cocoa with flavonoids. And then 12 weeks later, and then the statistical p-value, which indicates if there is a statistically identified likely difference if the p-value is below 0.05. If it says NS, that means there is no change, no difference, likely. Okay, so I'll cut through the details in one fell swoop. The placebo and NF conditions did not experience any changes over the 12 weeks, as shown by the NS results for every measure. However, the cocoa flavonoids condition did experience an improvement across two of the three measures, as noted by the two p-values below 0.05 here. Now, you might have noticed that Dr. Greger said this. Experienced a significant improvement in muscle strains, muscle mass, and all four measures of physical performance. For one, he mentions that all four metrics, and we just went over three, improved and we showed only two improved. The discrepancy is in how the data is shown. In the graphs that he shows, the researchers added walking distance, sit-ups, and reformatted the grip strength and up and go dance, I mean test, as comparisons of the deltas, which means that instead of looking at the end results at the end of the 12 weeks, they compare the overall change from baseline versus 12 weeks later. So he's right they are all significantly improved, statistically and clinically speaking. But remarkably, and I suppose it's because of the length of the video, he misses a few things. I'll return to what he misses in a few moments. I'd like to address the next part uh, about mitochondria first. But natural cocoa is so good, it can improve walking performance in those with peripheral artery disease, not only by improving blood flow, but as muscle biopsies showed, by improving mitochondrial activity, this is consistent with improved mitochondrial structure as well in biopsies taken from people's quads, though this study was um, actually uh, funded by Hershey's. Here he cites this study, which recruited people with a type of cardiovascular disease known as peripheral artery disease. It's essentially plaque that we associate with heart disease, but it's found in the periphery of our body, like our legs. Now, 
Dr. Greger claims that cocoa improved mitochondrial function, and that's not entirely true. It's actually mostly not true, at least based off of the data that he cites. For transparency, I've truncated this table for ease of reading, but you can find the full table of data in the linked study. Additionally, none of the other data is related to mitochondrial function except for one, but I'll get to it. So we see the placebo group compared against the cocoa group across two mitochondrial measures. One is citrate synthase, which is an enzyme involved in the TCA cycle of the mitochondrion. Essentially, it's a precursor system that allows mitochondria to generate energy. That's overly simplistic, but uh, let's roll with it for the time being. The second is called COX, which is an enzyme in the electron transport chain, which is directly involved in mitochondrial energy generation. What we see based on the p-values off to the right is that citrate synthase did not improve with cocoa powder use. However, COX enzyme activity did improve, or more accurately stated, it uh, stopped the decline in activity experienced in the placebo. Notice the minus 90 there for the placebo. So really, it's a mixed bag. On the other hand, a marker of mitochondrial biogenesis, that's production, PGC1-alpha, was not affected by cocoa powder. So while I consider this you know, a bit reductive, the evidence is mixed on if cocoa actually improves mitochondrial function. Although if you read the abstract alone, you'd be led to believe that it does. But I'd like to point out some of the other results of this study because they are, again, misleading. For example, measures directly related to peripheral artery disease did not improve, like flow-mediated dilation. So is Dr. Greger full of broccoli? And this time, I don't mean literally. Well, let's not end this yet. We have one more study, and I have a few things to mention that Dr. Greger missed. Briefly, let's open the last study, which was partly funded by the Hershey Company, as you heard Dr. Greger mention. Cracking open the data, here we see the improvements in that protein PGC1-alpha, and I mentioned did not improve in the last study. That's the protein heavily implicated in my mitochondrial biogenesis. The study was small, and yet all five participants experienced an increase in this protein. You can just follow the individual lines from before versus after. Then, looking at some of the other proteins involved directly in mitochondrial energy generation system, the COX enzymes, we see two different versions are increased. Now, remember, Dr. Greger mentioned the morphology or the shape of mitochondria was improved. This kind of statement is usually a dangerous one because mitochondria change shape really all the time, but that doesn't necessarily mean greater or worse health. And the evidence provided in the study was weak on its own. But it's true that if we pair that data with what we just went over, it does seem to indicate increased mitochondrial capacity, although more data is absolutely necessary, like functional measures especially. Anyway, why would this study disagree with the previous PGC1-alpha data? Well, it could be due to funding influence. I mean, I won't deny that. However, it's also possible that the participants themselves were just different. In this last study, the participants were type 2 diabetic, for example. That is a pretty major difference. It also matters where the biopsies are taken. In the diabetic study, the one that we just went over, they took muscle from the quadricep. And in the second study, looking at peripheral artery disease, they took samples from the calves. These differences can matter and aren't rooted in bias. Finally, this last study was open label and did not have a placebo group. So the results should really be interpreted with a healthy level of skepticism. Okay, we've reviewed the studies and now I'd like to circle back and point out some areas that Dr. Greger missed, as well as the final verdict from all this. If we return to this study, Dr. Greger missed that uh, cocoa powder group also experienced modest reductions in blood triglycerides, blood sugar, and more significant drops in lipoproteins containing cholesterol, like LDL. I would also point out that while Dr. Greger or his team mentioned the dose was 22 grams per day, the main ingredient, cocoa powder, was actually dosed at only 5 grams. Frankly, I don't think that consuming more will harm, but 22 grams may be a bit more cumbersome for some. So where does that actually leave us? It leaves me with this interpretation. 
Based on these three studies combined, natural, unfiltered cocoa is beneficial for physical function in older individuals, 60 and older, let's say, as well as people with peripheral artery disease and likely other cardiovascular diseases. Because we didn't discuss it, but the second study corroborated the evidence pointed out in the first study in relation to physical function. Cocoa may provide some benefit to mitochondria, but that evidence is really far shakier. So I wouldn't jump onto that ship quite yet. Still, while Dr. Greger is a bit overzealous stating the claims, he's not wrong. And I can certainly say that I learned something thanks to him, bringing, well, all this cocoa powder uh, to muscle function benefits to my attention. Unfortunately, some people end up way off base in their claims. Interested to see who? Well, I have a playlist dissecting the science of their claims in this linked video. Thanks for tuning in. I'll speak with you over there. Bye.